Okay, well, couldn't miss it in the news this week. It was quite a, quite a fuss in the media, quite a, an appropriate fuss in the media, it really was appropriate. About sad death of this Sunday Times journalist, American lady called Marie Colvin, working for the Sunday Times. And uh, we've, we've all seen that. The obituaries seem to centre around uh, the idea that her mission in life was to go out into the world, go to the nasty and dangerous places, and she had this kind of personal mission, really, to be uh, exposing the world's horrors to open scrutiny to change the situations, to seek to change the way the world was working. She's what you call a crusading journalist. But what do those people do to you? What's the effect of those people on you? See, her last report from the besieged city of Homs in Syria carried these words. I started, I think, with these words. Today I watched a baby die. Now, what does that do to you? I'm not going to go on down that road because a good proportion of us find it all too painful to be profitable. We feel that. It's far away, but we nonetheless feel it. And then again, this very week I happened, you know the way you, you tend to happen to do things when God is about. You know something? Sort of uh, I happen to ring a guy I know who's um, just a young fellow moving into uh, pioneering patterns of Christian ministry. And I just happened to phone him and he says, look, I'm driving and you can talk, you can talk, I'm driving, I'm on my way. There's somebody with a child, who, a baby, that was really very unwell, with a very bad heart problem. And they've been heavily involved. They, they're stuck in people in his missus. They got well stuck into the situation to try and help. And in doing so, um, they obviously exposed themselves emotionally to the situation. They said, I'm just going to see such and such a person and the baby has, has, has sadly died. How does that affect you? You see, again, you feel it. And, and there's this young fella, you know, moving into ministry, going off. He's not afraid to get stuck in. You know, good man, um, and he's going off to deal with that horrible situation. I can encourage him this very, very poorly, and I can pray for him that day, and that's all. Can you imagine having to deal with that sort of terrible thing day after day? And some people do. And you observe in them something they, they discovered in the 50s, really, in 1951, the first work was done on it. You discover this thing called compassion fatigue. Come across compassion fatigue. It's how the human psyche seems to try to deal with things that are unpleasant to know about and see and be involved with. We can't take the nastiness of it, so we numb our compassion out of existence to stay in control of our senses. It's very understandable, isn't it? It's very understandable. They reckon it's actually impacting our society at large to watch the sort of reporting that people like Marie Colvin do. And journalism analysts, yes, there are such things, people make money out of the most amazing things, don't they? They argue the media has caused widespread compassion fatigue in society by saturating newspapers, by saturating the television and radio news with decontextualised images and stories of, of tragedy and suffering. And so the public becomes slightly cynical and resistance builds up to helping people who are suffering. And so if you're in the street and you see somebody being assaulted and beaten and whatever, there's a greater willingness in this day and age to mind your own business and to carry straight on. The truth about it is this, it is hard to go on giving love because we're hurt by hard things like this. And we can't keep on resourcing love and compassion out of our own reserves of love and compassion because they run out. In short, our human ability to show compassion is a bucket that leaks and proves very hard to refill. Now, God's love, by comparison, is not so much wondrous because it is unconditional. Because it isn't unconditional. God's love is not unconditional. God's love is conditional on the faith that leads to repentance and so on. The amazing thing about God's love is not that it's unconditional, but that it is persistent and infinite. Does that make sense? Does that ring any bells? Is that, you know, unconditional love? No, actually it's not. It's just very, very persistent. And infinite. And it's that love of God, that love which is uniquely God's, that, that gives to undeserving faith, that persists and continues and perseveres. 
with the unlovely and the unloving, it is that sort of love that human beings lack. Now having laid open that issue, let's just have a look at what this passage is about today. John 15 verse 9. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you'll remain in my love, just as I've obeyed my Father's commands and remain in His love. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you, that your joy may be complete. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. How are we going to love each other as He has loved us? The answer is in the book. Because the love that Jesus is talking about there is not a love that you've got to go and do. It's a love that you've got to persist in deriving from Him. Can you see where we're going? Here it comes. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. There's, as it were, this great big nutrient cycle of heavenly love. Right? There's a cycle going on. I'll show you a picture in a minute. Now I say heavenly love because this is a particular Greek word with a technical meaning in Scripture. Here it is. Can you see that on the wall there? Kathos agapesen mehopata. As the Father has loved me with this agape, can you see that word? It's in yellow for you. There it is. With this agape love, God the Father has poured his agape on the Son. So also, in the same way, have I Pour this out and pay on you, says Jesus. And now you will just stay in my agape. Imagine a picture of a shower. You're not going to get clean and washed, Caleb, are you? Unless you stay under the under the spray. And of course, when you're not used to showers, and when you're a younger person, much younger than you, you don't like to be in the spray, do you? You don't you can in that shower box to get away from that horrible wet stuff that's coming down at you. But the whole point of God's love is this, and the love that we're to show is this. It gets poured on us from above. But you've got to stay under the shower head. First of all, that love is from the Father to the Son. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now we take it for granted, don't we? There's love between the members of the Trinity. Father, Son, Spirit. We take it for granted. This is a committee which is like no other committee because they all love each other for starters and it works. When did you ever hear a sermon or read a book about the Father's love for the Son? Anybody? See, this is what happens when you're preparing something. You go, what am I going to look at about that? <laughs> you know, you go have a look at it. There's nothing. And you go through the systematic theology and there's nothing. And you go through the Bible dictionaries and there's nothing. And you get, you know, the, the big thick books about the Greek words off the shelf. And you look through the book and there's, there's virtually nothing at all written about the Father's love for the Son. There seems to be a very clear reason for that. I went back to the Bible, which is always a good idea when you're in the fix. And I took a good look at the, uh, at the incidences of two words taken together in the Bible. Two words, Son and Love. Son and love. Now there are a few places where the Son wasn't God the Son, or the Father wasn't God the Father, or both. So I filtered those out and I binned those, and this is what I was left with. Three eyewitness accounts of the heavenly voice and all vision at Christ's baptism in the Jordan by John the Baptist. Three. This is my beloved Son, whom I love. With him I'm well pleased. Yeah? Three accounts of that. One account of that in 2 Peter when he's talking about it incidentally. Two eyewitness accounts of the voice from heaven at the transfiguration, when Jesus is up the mountain, he's transfigured in heavenly glory. This is my son, my love, hear him. And one, aside really, about the father's love for his son when he was sending him to the wicked tenants in the parable in Luke 20. They listened to him, he's my son. Each eyewitness account of the baptism or transfiguration simply states the father loves the son, is well pleased with him. The two Peter account tells us no more than that. The parable of the wicked tenants is even more cursory than that. And then there's this verse here that we're looking at today. That's it. We have no developed theology in Scripture of the Father's love for the Son, simply because it is one of the great givens that underlines the Lord's earthly life and ministry. 
he lives, you see him living in the, in the love of the Father. He shows it. There's no great expatiating on the theme, because it's just a big given. The Father loves the Son. It's so fundamental, it just is. But we do know that the love the Lord has for his people begins with God the Father's love for God the Son. And that is fundamental to what this passage is telling us. We'll soon see. For now, grasp this truth. It fundamentally, absolutely is. The Father loves the Son. And the Son then pours that love on his brothers, his adopted brothers. That's us. Now there's a great deal more written in Scripture about the love the Lord Jesus has for his disciples. And you can immediately rationalise why that might be the case. It's about us. It involves us. Um, I don't know who you're on Twitter with or whatever, but I've noticed um, a bit of negativity on, on Facebook in particular recently, on social media sites, when a husband has chosen to, to use his Twitter feed or his Facebook timeline to profess his undying affection for his dearly beloved, or she for him. Uh, it's not the sort of thing I do. Sorry, dear. Uh, I just... Oh, it's a little bit pukey for me, I'm afraid. Uh, sometimes it's, it's get a room time on it, it's ridiculous. <laughs> When the matter concerns us, it's right that we should know about it. This is my point, which I'm clinging to. As the love the Lord Jesus for us as his followers does concern us, there's plenty about it in the Bible. Whereas the intimacy between the Father and the Son doesn't concern us, we'd expect to hear a lot about it in the book, wouldn't we? But no, it's just, it's between them. So the Lord's love for his disciples recurs frequently across the pages of the New Testament. It's described, it's discussed, it's depicted for us right through the Synoptic Gospels, it's reflected on theologically and pastorally throughout the Epistles, and then in Revelation it's portrayed in the love and the self-sacrifice of the Lamb in the middle of the throne. So the whole section of John's Gospel that we've been in for the last few months now, this farewell discourse, it begins in chapter 3 like this. Chapter 13, like this. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. And having loved his own who were in the world, and that's been described, of course, in the earlier chapters of John's Gospel, he now showed them the full extent of his love. And what did he do? Do you remember what he does next? What do you do next, Caleb? Uh, he, he loved them to the Yes, it's to do with his love. How does he show them the full extent of his love? He gets a towel. And he washes their feet. Yeah, got it now. Yeah, we are, just a little hint, we're there. Uh, so he takes a towel, he puts it around him, and he, he, he fulfills their most basic human needs. They've got sweaty feet. <laughs> Come on. This is the incarnate Son of God. He sees the need and his compassion for them in such a small thing you think. There's no provision made for them to wash their feet. They're coming here. We're going to be here all night now. We're going to have our dinner. We're going to be lying down on these couches and his head's going to be next to my feet. And, and Jesus is coming. And wash your feet. Tucks a towel on his waist and the Lord of the universe, come in the flesh on his mission of redeeming love, sets about caring for their most basic unmet human needs of dirty feet. And that love is... It's evident in the tenderness and the care he shows his disciples now in those following chapters as he, as, as he heads into the teeth of hell himself to draw the sting of death on the cross. And then in this chapter he says, Great, Greater love, chapter 15, verse 13, Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. And then that is exactly what he goes out and does on the cross. And the point that's being made here, in this part here, in John 15, 9 following, the point that's being made is that his loving example is to be the inspiration of their love, and their compassion, and their care, and their foot washing. And that's where Jesus is taking us in this morning's verse. Because the love pours from the Father to the Son, from the Son to the adopted brothers, and from the adopted brothers to... Where? Well, somewhere. See, Jesus says, John 15, 12, My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. And we say, come. How am I going to do I haven't got it in me. Ha, ha, yes. The penny drops. Grasshopper. This is it. You haven't got it in you, Jesus is saying. You haven't got it in you. You've got to be getting that regularly from somewhere else. But the command is still there. Love one another as I 
have loved you. It's not the first and greatest commandment, which is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind, but it is the second, which is like it, to love your neighbour as yourself. And John is very big on this. John teaches that brotherly love is one of the evidences of genuine faith, the big indication that the love of God has truly touched your heart and life, that you're standing in the flow of the Father's love through the Son. So in 1 John 3, you know what 1 John? We'll do 1 John one day. I'd like to do 1 John. I just haven't felt it was right for us at the moment. 1 John's great. He goes through all these tests of genuine Christianity. And there's a cycle of it. They go round and round and round, all the way through the book until he gets to the end. As if he's, he's made his point a number of times, and that's it. Boy, chaps. Okay? There are three tests. Obedience, love, and sound doctrine. And those are the three things through 1 John that indicate the genuineness of somebody's Christian faith. Look, here's one of those. If you've experienced the love of God, the saving love of God in Jesus Christ, he says, look, this is what's going to happen. You're going to be manifesting that love, pouring it off into the world. Now that leaves us in a bit of a tight corner, because we know we ought to be loving one another. And we feel that we want to be loving one another, loving other people as well. And John, in that passage, one John is talking about seeing a brother in material need, having material means and not meeting your brother's needs. Very practical, very basic, very nuts and bolts. We know, we know we want to do that, but we know we're not too good at doing that. We don't feel compassion the way we'd like to. We don't show it the way we'd like to. And we somewhat suspect it could be threatening and dangerous and beyond us to try. We've been asked for something we really haven't completely got in us. And can't generate or perpetuate from within us. So that's the big issue in this verse. That's why the big issue in this verse. Remaining in Christ's love is so practically, functionally important. Because it's that handed down nature of the love we're to show in this world that A makes it happen, and B reflects on God's love for humanity, which lies at the heart of the message we're supposed to pass on. It's His love we're speaking about. It's His love we're showing, not ours. So the derived nature of, of such love as we can show for other people is essential to us. Now let me show you a diagram. I, did another I know you like diagrams. Some of you really like diagrams. I did a diagram for you of the agapetic cycle. I invented that word. It's a good word, isn't it? Do you like that? Not the cycle word. They've been around for a long time. Agapetic. Look at that. What? Colours everything. Um, I've discovered a new technology. It's called the infographic. Have you come across infographics? Marvellous. In our day, we used to call it a diagram, okay? And, and there it is, on the wall. Brilliant. You can do those in PowerPoint, which is great for doing them in, even for artistic buckets like me. And you can put them up on slideshow slide on the internet or something. And there it is for everybody to see. Have a look at the Facebook page for the church, and you will see that. Maybe later you'll see these slides as well, because there's an opportunity to do that. Well. Here's how it goes. God steps in. See that lightning coming down there, that word at the end of it. Remain in my love. Right? The Father loves the Son. The Son loves the disciples. The disciples love the disciples. And the more disciples love the Father. How about that? That's pretty cool, isn't it? Uh, you know, remarkably underwhelmed. You're looking remarkably underwhelmed. But the truth is fantastic. And it all fits in this context that Jesus is talking about. It's to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit like that. That's why you remain in the vine. Does that make any sense to anybody? I appreciate it. You appreciate it. Mike likes pictures. He loves pictures. You know, just keep him away from the sun on Sunday that's out today, okay? Because you know, pictures in that will be any good for him. Take him, to, take him to slideshare on the internet and show him that. That'll be marvellous. Here's the way the fruit of abiding in the vine and standing beneath the shower of the love that starts out with the Father, travels through the Son, fuels our hearts to love our neighbours. Here's how it gets born and here's how we get away with over that deficit of compassion fatigue that we'll hit otherwise as we try and do it. At the end of it all, out comes the fruit of staying in the vine, loving one another. This is to my Father's glory that you bear loads of that sort of fruit. And at the end of it all, we see the first and the fundamental fruit of the Spirit of God described for us in Galatians 5, too, which is... Fruit of the Spirit is. I'm so glad somebody didn't say grapes, because that would have been really awful, wouldn't it? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self control. It suddenly looks all the more crucial, doesn't it, for disciples to remain in the vine, sucking up the sap of the Father's love, expressed to us through God the Son. It becomes all the more important to know how to remain in his love. 